welcome to episode five of the Power Score LSAT podcast. This is John Dinning down in Los Angeles, California. And this is Dave Kaloran in Napa Valley. Dave, how you doing? I'm doing great, actually. Are you? Still yeah, raining I'm excited. up there, as always. Uh, it's actually epic rain up here. They have just evacuated the Russian River Valley over in Sonoma, Jesus so boy. that doesn't happen often. No, build yourself an ark. No, I'm good. Okay. Well, if you're going to have to stay indoors, I guess the most obvious question is, what are you soothing the rain pain with? What's your drink? What is my drink? I will tell you, today I am having beer because it just seemed like it was time. We've gone through hard alcohol to wine. Let's move to beer. And I'm actually drinking a beer that I randomly discovered when I was on a trip with you That's right. uh, to Amsterdam. And the beer is Hogarten, which apparently over there is pronounced Hoogarten. But it doesn't matter. But it's a Belgian white beer that I think is just deluxe. Yeah, I think we almost drank Amsterdam dry of it uh, in the time that we were there. And other things, and yeah. And other things. Happily, <laughs> everything's been restocked. Um, well, in the what, spirit... What are you drinking? Uh, right. In the spirit of uh, tonight's topic, where we talk a little bit about the battle and the decision between the prestige and reputation of a school versus trying to save money and be cost efficient uh, and do things as cheaply as possible... You've gone the prestige route very clearly. Yes. So I took the other path. I went the cost efficient route. <laughs> I'm over here uh, nursing a Miller High Life, the champagne ah, of beers. Uh, I'm not proud beer. of it, but I'll get a lot more mileage for my money, at least. Nah, you should be proud of it. My wife likes that beer quite a bit. Tell me it's not her favorite beer. Um, I don't know that it's her favorite beer, but her dad used to drink it, and so she just has fond memories of that kind of thing. Fair enough, I suppose. Tradition. You know, if she yeah. hadn't married you, I'd really question her taste. <laughs> you should still question her taste. What are you talking about? Well, I probably should. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of taste, let's talk about what we're listening to. Yeah, so I'm picked, also excited about this. You picked this song. Uh, I did. I cannot fault your taste in this one. I like this tune. No, and it's a song that I like quite a bit. It is from a Los Angeles band, actually, named Saint Motel. And the song is My Type. Yeah. And that's actually kind of a, a relevant choice, as usual, because <laughs> today we're trying to figure out exactly what the best fit is for people who are making choices about where to go to school. Should they go more towards the money? Should they go more towards a prestige slash ranking? So trying to figure out what your type is is right in that vein and I think makes quite a bit of sense. And on top of that, the song is super cool. It's a so, good song. Yeah. yeah. And that's exactly Take right. This whole episode is going to be basically about how do you pick your perfect match? What is your type in terms of school based on a number of different factors, which yes. we'll talk about. We'll link that song. Um, what's interesting, too, about the song choice is that it wasn't an obvious one. In fact, there was much debate and many competing options. Not, well, for yeah. me, for me, because a lot of tonight's conversation is ultimately going to be about money. It is. And that obviously suggests a number of different choices. That's right. But I do think that those choices are a little bit more obvious. <laughs> if, if you choose like Pink Floyd's money, which would be really knows. easy to choose yeah. and everybody knows, it's kind of like, OK, yeah, talking about money. I think, you know, the same motel choice is just cooler. It's a better yeah. it's a better fit to the idea of like the uncertainty that's going on. It's not just money. There are other things and you need to choose the best school for you. Completely. Which is also why Cardi B's money didn't quite make the cut. <laughs> I hate to put her on the same pedestal as Pink Floyd in this case. Um, <laughs> you just did. But I'll leave that. Yeah, I'll leave that be. Let me throw a curveball at you. Though. Oh, that's right. Um, let me throw a curveball at you. Uh, yeah. and insert one very quick aside here because I'm very excited about this. It happens maybe once or twice a year and I get to uh, indulge my girlfriend your little girl is uh -huh. currently selling girl scout cookies i know yes, this is not is. news to you um, but it was <laughs> very exciting news for me so uh not only have i gone and bought way too many um, I'm gonna, not enough actually maybe not i'm gonna need a you second need freezer more. but i want to ask you since your house is probably littered with girl scout cookie boxes it um, is. what's your preference which one if i had to buy one would you recommend it what's my favorite girl scout cookie that's the question that's easy, man. Uh, I like Samoas. I'm sure that's a popular so, choice. And I think the peanut butter one, which is, I think, do si yeah. I like those two. And then Thin Mint. Those are my top three. Yeah, Thin Mint in that was order. the one I really went over the top with this time. Thin Mint's kind of like the classic Girl Scout cookie where everybody knows it. It's hard to dislike that cookie. Yeah. 
So oh, I'm boring and predictable. That's what you're telling me. <laughs> I can take it. I wasn't saying that. Yeah, I seem to be diabetic, probably. You see what I've just ordered. I uh, hope so. Order more. <laughs> broken diabetic. That's a great look. I, I think I'll actually probably post a tweet about that. I never use my Twitter account for personal stuff. Ah, this is a good cause. I think I might do it. Every once in a while, I post a picture of her, and it, it, it gets a pretty hilarious response to me and then I show her that people liked it and she thinks that's funny so. well she's a perfect child so you should post more pictures frankly I don't know if she's perfect but she's pretty great oh, she's my favorite so, <laughs> she's the only small child you know for now <laughs> I'm going to be an uncle in about two weeks and then oh I'll my have God, to split right. my affections God, I'm sure congratulations to go again. Around. Uh, I'm also going to post a link to her little Girl Scout cookie sales page in the description nice. for this episode because Pure stock up people stock up well, in an episode about money, I think it fits. There you go. Put it to a good cause and a delicious cause. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little more recently then. Back to the LSAT. What's yes. been going on out there in the LSAT world? You know, this has actually been an eventful week, I'd say. Mm. Uh, on LSAC's part, there really hasn't been a whole lot in terms of registration deadlines or anything. All that's passed now. So right. what they've done in the last week is actually update and post a few different things. And just... The, I think it was today or they or yesterday, they posted a new blog. So there is a new law colon fully blog that has been posted out there. And I will never uh, yeah, dislike saying it. Don't in ever that gloss over that colon. <laughs> I will never <laughs> tire of doing that. Um, this one's interesting. It, it's it's kind of LSAT related, but I mean, let's be honest, not really. Uh, the The topic is about legal education in India. And I would say that the reason they posted this is because it's now been 11 years since yeah. they started the LSAT India. And if you're not aware, there is a test used in India by high school students who are going on to college and getting law degrees because the system there is a little bit different. And they contracted with LSAC to make this test. And so they've been making it now for 11 years. Yeah. And if I recall correctly, it's given once a year. It's like April or May that they give it. Yeah, I think May. The yeah, they in this case is Pearson View, which is this yeah. global behemoth of a test administration company. Billion dollar company. Yeah, they're a big deal. Yeah, but LSAC makes it. And so they actually have uh, driven those out there. And it's like 53 colleges in India now use that test. And so it's, it's a growing market for LSAC. It's not nearly as big as the LSAT in the U.S., right. but it is kind of interesting that way. It's a fascinating program that I think a lot of people are unaware of, that you take this at, I suppose, 18, right out of high school, for another five years of study, kind of like our undergrad, but then you're an Indian lawyer, as it were. Mm -hmm. That's um, exactly right. The other really cool feature of this, and maybe most relevant for anyone listening, uh, is that there are some LSAT India exams available online to download for free that are previously unreleased as part of LSAC's normal North American prep test series. Uh, yeah. In fact, if you go to the main LSAT India page, which again, we'll link down in the comments, uh, there are three tests there that you can open up, download as PDFs. The first one, interestingly enough, not so useful. It's a version of the June 2007 test. I think it was given in India in 2009. Um, I say a version because they've actually altered two parts of it. One is that they've changed a lot of the names on that test to more Indian uh, sounding centric names. For instance, uh, there's a game in there. I think it's game number two that has three films being shown, Greed, Harvest, and Limelight, were the original versions in the 2007 test here in North America. They changed them on that test to Gambir, Hasin, and Linghinga. I'm butchering that, I'm sure. Game three, there was a cruise ship. They changed it from Freedom to the Azad, etc. But the test itself, in terms of what it's actually given, is the same. Uh, the other thing they've changed is they've pulled an answer choice off every question. So you go from five multiple choice question to a four answer multiple choice question on that particular test. But the other two are new, given in 2010 and 2012, I believe in India. Uh, there are five answer tests, so very relevant to anyone taking the, the regular test here. Um, so a cool opportunity to get some more free content if you're in the market for it. You think you should do those tests like in the regular stream or should you wait to do them at the end after you've finished all the U.S or U.S., Canada, LSAT. You know, from what I've seen, and I've looked at these tests pretty closely, as I know you probably have, um, there's nothing on them that differentiates them enough to think that they're not as relevant, if that 
both answers and dodges your question. A little bit. I've always thought they're <laughs> slightly easier, which makes a lot of sense given the audience that they're at, they're using. Right. And which is I no knock on you know the audience yeah. itself. More the no. age. They're high school. Graduates, we right. may not know what kind of protocols they use culturally to make changes. Mm -hmm. So I've always said to students, go finish all the U.S., Canada, regular LSAT, so to speak. And then if you are really, truly out of tests, mm -hmm. take a look at the LSAT India ones. At worst, you could use it to just you know, keep warm uh, before the <laughs> test, you know, warm up and to uh, also kind of you know, keeping your groove during the week beforehand. Yeah. So I don't think they're highly relevant or necessary to do. Um, right. And f obviously, like, that first test is basically the June 2007 test. Well, certainly but it's an easier version because you've lost one wrong answer every time. So yeah. even in a worst case guessing, you've got a 25% chance as opposed to just 20 Um so yeah, that test uh, of the three that are out there, uh, you can ignore it. Go do the June 20, 2007 instead. The other two, I'd call them, like you say, I'd say they're relevant, but not necessary. They're just a, a happy piece of extra if you need it. Agreed. Yeah. So what else did they do this week? Because I know they did a lot more. Uh, well, I don't know about a lot more, but <laughs> <laughs> there was a little more. There was a podcast <laughs> that they put out titled Keeping Up to Data and Cheeky. Um, a whopping four minutes and 18 seconds, I believe. But there was some it's interesting... longer than the last one, though. <sighs> the last one was like half that. These are like high school morning announcements, not podcasts. But um, they did run through some of the applicant volume numbers year over year, which was really interesting, um, where applicant volume is down on the whole about 4%. U.S. applicants, though, that's global applicants. U.S. applicants are about even... Uh, in certain places, law schools in the South Central region saw a slight bump actually a slight increase in applications. Exactly. Although, honestly, to me, the most interesting part of what he talked about, and not to dismiss the data, it's just that right. we're only part way through the cycle. So we can't really know the final numbers. It's, it's hard to tell premature. from year to yeah. year. Uh, was when they talked about the writing sample mm -hmm. and the way they're going to be handling that coming uh, upcoming for these these future tests. And we've talked about this before. In fact, in episode one, we explained that they are going to separate the writing sample from your regular test day experience. So you will take it at on a separate day. You'll take it online. And um, they've now said that if you have taken and provided a writing sample at any point up to and prior to March 20 of 19, you won't have to take the, the writing sample again. Right. So if you took this... Uh, January LSAT and you did your writing sample as you should and then you go to take the July LSAT they're not going to give you the writing sample at the end of it you in fact you'll never June, have to do another fact, one yeah starting in yeah, June, June as well do another one, yeah. I was using July as an example which is also true yeah and and, and that's that's true for every single one of them so that's kind of cool because you know, it's not like you need to have five writing samples and students who are going to take the LSAT multiple times and there's going to be more and more of them are really just wasting their time there it's the same type of idea although if you do in fact want to retake the writing sample so maybe you didn't like your first one or you're disappointed in yourself for making the wrong choice <laughs> uh, you can come back and you can actually provide a new writing sample response <laughs> Uh, however, it's not free. You can request it. Is, it yeah. It's $15 for your opportunity to write another sample. Because they will never not squeeze you for another nickel. <laughs> you Ridiculous. cannot tell me that you're surprised by that. Yeah, you're going to have to give me a minute till my eyes unroll. That's just <laughs> brutally money grubbing. I... Anyway, if you've done a writing sample up to this March test, you're covered. And unless you wrote something truly ridiculous or terrible, don't pay them 15 more dollars. Uh, I mean, some small fee is probably warranted, but at the same time, $15 for what's going to be an online exercise that is almost fully automated. Yeah, it's frustrating to see this, but one way either way, it. now we know what it is that they're doing. And at least we won't have to do writing samples right. in the future, which is its own kind of uh, huge benefit. Although to be crystal clear, I hope on this, if you do sign up for a future test, say June, September, whenever, the writing sample is included with that fee. You can do it if you want to. This is only for people who aren't taking another LSAT, but who want to submit another writing sample. That's where the fee would come in. 
All right. So now we know. Yeah, now I didn't want anybody listening know. to this to be like, oh, God, it's 190 plus 15. That's <laughs> not the case unless, again, you just want to do an extra one. That's a good point, and that means that the sample that we're talking about is, I would assume, and actually hope, is going to be relatively small there. Yeah, so I believe we so. shall see. Let's get to the last thing that they actually it's not they haven't done it yet, but they've announced it. Right. Um, and that is another one of their Kelly and Ken webinars uh, that is coming up. And this one, I think, may may actually be a little bit more interesting. And they have titled it March Madness, the present and future of law school rankings. And I, I have to give LSAC a little bit of credit here. They're, they're trying to get a little punchier and livelier with the titling, you know, keeping up to data. Even the Law Colon Foley blog name, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly likable, yeah. uh, even if there's a little comic element to it. And here, March Madness, I'm like, all right, you know, keeping up with uh, what's going on in the world of sports. So the cool thing about that, and this is one of the reasons that I'll probably tune in and see uh, what they have to say is they get Bob Morse, the mm-hmm. guy who is really the overseer of the U.S. News and World Report rankings. And so um, it'll be interesting to see what he has to say. He's in there with a couple of deans, uh, one from Miami and the new dean from Northwestern, and they'll be talking about rankings. And, you know, that's a, a mixed environment. I wonder how Bob feels about that, because most law school deans are not very thrilled with the rankings. That's right. Um, a while back, all the law school deans signed a letter basically saying, we'd really love to see this go away because it just doesn't capture what our school is and certainly doesn't capture why school might be good for someone or might not be good for someone, which is interesting because that's a really relevant topic to, to what we're talking about this evening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's on uh, March 4th. If anybody got listening to this prior to that date, you can tune in as well. And I agree, a hat tip to LSAT for trying to be a little hip with these titles. <laughs> um, the final very brief thing that's actually behind us now, so I, I mentioned it in reflection only, is that they extended the March registration deadline two days. Uh, they took it from February 20th, or yeah, February 20th to February 22nd to register for the upcoming March test. Again, if you're listening to this now, haven't registered, uh, tough luck. It's too late. Too late for you. Um, a bit of historical trivia. The original date, I believe, was actually February 25th. And then they moved it to the 20th and then the 22nd. So, hmm. yeah, it's a bit of hopscotch when it comes to this sometimes. It seems like they couldn't decide what they wanted. <laughs> That's See almost the theme of one, episode one. If you want to know, right. <laughs> Who am I? Who I do not I? know what I, what I want or what I'm doing. Uh, well, it, as a segue from who am I, what we're really going to focus on tonight uh, is a discussion of you as an applicant beginning to receive, hopefully, acceptances back from multiple schools and trying to decide who am I when it comes to saying yes. Where do you want to go? What's the best fit for you? Uh, and a lot of this, as I'm sure Dave would acknowledge, is built off of a blog post that you made uh, and that kind of blew up. It's been one of the more popular posts that's out there, and that's saying something. So we have a lot. Hmm. Uh, titled Scholarship versus Prestige. Um, we'll link to that blog post in the comments. Again, so you guys will have a lot of things to click down there. But this post in particular really is trying to weigh the two sides of this equation. Do you go for the better school every time? Do you go for the cheaper option every time? When you're not sure, how do you decide? So that's going to be the main thrust of this conversation. Yeah, and I think that's a... This is the critical question that a lot of people are facing right now, as a matter of fact, and we'll see it over the next month or two. That's right. And interestingly enough, that blog post every year gets a wave of comments <laughs> right about this period of time. And so I, I try to answer every question that's posted there and at least provide insight. And so that was part of the genesis of why we wanted to talk about this is because it can be really hard to know especially if you're not in this field or you don't know people who are lawyers or, and it's sometimes you talk to a lawyer who's been in practice for 30 years. They don't know the, the current landscape for right. someone who is just graduated from law school and is trying to get a job or, or to finalize that. And so the idea that we really want to focus on tonight is, is twofold. First, we're going to, we're going to talk about some of the tools that we look at when we're trying to make this decision, Mm -hmm. because I'm not about making decisions based upon just some general gut feeling when we know there is hard data out there. Yeah. 
So we want to look at that hard data and I want to talk a little bit about that and some of the tools that I will go look at and, uh, and reference. Yeah. Very and quickly so, before we do, I'm going to see if I can make you blush because me. that blog post in particular, look, you and I, I think, uh, I would like to think, both pride ourselves on our accessibility, uh, the degree of service that we try to provide to people literally day and night around the clock. And that's not just our students, it's really everybody. But that blog post is a singular shining example of just how far you're willing to go for a collection of random strangers. Again, guys, if you're listening to this, go click on it and just spend five minutes scrolling, not reading. It's just going to take you that long to get to the bottom of the comments. <laughs> That's true. Because it's a massive amount of effort that you've put in for, again, not our customers, not our students, and not even our potential customers, which I think is a point that a lot of They're people past us. Yeah, these are people that have gone beyond the test prep phase. They're at the final, really, stages of their decision process to go to school. There is nothing in this for you, for us, except just pure, unadulterated assistance. And I think you're a saint for doing it. Uh, it's because you don't have to. I, that's mostly why <laughs> I appreciate it so much. Well, I've analogized this before, as uh, you've probably heard or seen online. Like, imagine any somewhat significant company that you deal with, with any regularity, being able to just immediately, reliably access the person at the very top. That doesn't happen. Like, I said to someone recently, they were talking about you specifically in your Twitter. Uh, and I was like, imagine you're some like, I don't know, season ticket holder for an NFL team or even more mundane or more low key. Imagine you're just watching like the Super Bowl on TV and you have a question about, I don't know, field goals or something like how do those work? Imagine you could reach out to like Robert Kraft. The I owner was coming of the Patriots. <laughs> the Robert Kraft jokes. Yeah. Reach out to Robert. OK. I don't know. <laughs> Try not to linger on your the coming. But imagine that you could reach out directly to Robert Kraft and expect to not only get in touch with him, but to get a response in, in between massages, presumably. But imagine you had that level of access to someone like that. That's insane. That doesn't happen. So point being, uh, granted, he's, he's a hard man to get a hold of. <laughs> uh, unless you charge him by the hour. <laughs> what? I know, I'm sorry. Well, uh... I mean... Who could play? He's wearing six he's, rings. That's dangerous. He, well, he's a, he's an easy target right now. That's yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, know. I could do this all night, but look, let's let's get a grip. Yes, we'll cross the lines. We'll blow up in our face <laughs> again all night. Uh, but uh, kudos to you, my man. A shout out. I think you've done uh, a Herculean thing there, and it's really impressive. I you should know. also say if anybody's listening to this and feels <laughs> particularly uh, motivated to start to pester Dave, keep it realistic. He's, well, he's a one-man army sometimes. I, you know, I'll be honest. I actually get a lot out of answering those questions. You know, it keeps me really current with what's going on, yeah. and that's something that's really important. And I also look at it as this is, you know, what we do isn't just, hey, it's the LSAT, thanks, goodbye. Right. Um, it's it's an entire pathway. You're hopefully taking the opportunities that people have and maximizing them. And that's a large part of why I do this. And I love the feedback. I love hearing from someone that they're like, Hey, your books really helped. Or I got this score and I got into this school and I'm stoked about it. Right. So there's certainly a tremendous amount of benefit for me personally, just to have those conversations. And, you know, I think there's goodwill for us too. Uh, I, I would say that it, it may be that a lot of those people are never going to work with us again, but the fact that they had a really great experience from beginning to end, that that's really worth it for me. That's why I do this. Yeah. So um, I don't want you to, it's not completely selfless. Like, oh, I'm just giving away my time for free. I get fairly something charitable too. charitable though. Although it did provide us some nice fodder for this conversation tonight. Which <laughs> just because we'll you to. get to bring up uh, craft. Oh yeah, any opportunity. <laughs> don't Let's tempt me back into subject. it. I've got more. But well, let's talk okay. instead about yes. some of those those tools that you mentioned, the places that you and I both go when we're posed these questions from people and where we encourage people to go as well. Yeah. And what we're going to do is we're going to first talk about those tools and then we're going to apply some of them to a selected group of scenarios that we're going to throw out there and say, all right, this is the question that we got. And we're going to give everybody the opportunity to see what they might choose, and then we'll break it down. And you can see whether or not you agree with us or even with what the student actually did. So typically what I do is as I go through this and I see a question come in, the first thing that I want to do is I want to know what schools are in play. 
when you, when you talk about scholarship and prestige, sometimes you have schools that are very similar, but more often than not, you have schools that have very disparate rankings. You might have the 75th ranked school versus the 25th ranked school. And when you're looking at schools, probably the most important thing is to sit down and analyze the actual numbers for each school. Right. And I like to use LST reports. LST is law school transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, it's headed up by a guy named Kyle McEntee, who is a friend of mine. I'm on their advisory board along with a, another, a bunch of other people who do LSAT prep and admissions and, and law school related activities. And the site is, it's, it's a nonprofit. They basically use the ABA data and combine it in a way I think is really visually helpful. The basic tool that they have is great, and then the LST Pro tool is also really useful, and yeah. I find myself going to that constantly. So we'll put we'll links link to that. those resources as well. Yeah, we're going to link everything. It, yeah, everything we refer to here will get linked. And what you can do is you can look at each individual school, and they give you a ton of data on employment figures, mm -hmm. uh, the types of jobs, the total cost, all the LSAT GPA information, um, the regions that people go to study in and so forth. And so you can look at individual schools that way. And then you can also compare schools. They yeah. have a comparison tool. And so when someone says, I'm looking at two schools, that's always the first thing that I do is I take a look at the comparison. And the point that's really interesting is all of this information is drawn from really larger documents that come from the ABA. Mm -hmm. Each year, law schools are forced to fill out a Form 509 that is a required disclosure. And the ABA maintains a website called abarequireddisclosures.org, and we'll post that too, that has all this data and actually shows things like uh, you know, attrition rate for schools. How many students did each school lose? And why did they lose them? And were they male or female? And, and what was going on? As well as scholarship information and a ton of other data that can be really helpful when you're trying to make decisions. So the first thing that you should start with with any kind of analysis of, of offers and comparison is get the hardcore numbers that are going to tell you as much as possible about how the people who are attending and then graduating that school are actually doing in the job market. For sure. So, and when we get into that, we'll look at employment figures. We'll look at the types of those jobs. We'll look at where those jobs were all the way down the line. And so all the stuff that you think that would be relevant, like cost and so forth, that's all going to figure in the analysis that we make. Yeah. Now, I've seen the people second even create thing, spreadsheets with all of these sort of as tables they and stuff with different schools. Oh, um, yeah. I worked with a student last year who her spreadsheets I thought were fabulous. Yeah. She had so much data in them, and she was able to track everything, and she was negotiating scholarships at the end, and she could see exactly – she had a pretty good sense of where she was going to end up in terms of the money she was being offered, but it was really easy to make comparisons and she'd be like, yeah, look at these two. There's just right. no way I'm going to go here for that cost. Really a fantastic way is track everything, whether it's LSAT prep or whether it's law schools and acceptances and, and financials. Yeah, it's reminiscent of the kind of retake stuff that we recommended where people track their past performance. This is the same thing. Be precise, be data driven. Try to qualify as much of this as you can. That's exactly the case. So the second thing is, and this is more controversial, but I look <laughs> at rankings. Yeah. And it's controversial really for, you know, law schools and law school deans. It's not controversial for me or you no. or any, any student. Everybody looks at rankings. Now, no matter what your feeling is about rankings, uh, there is some degree of reflectivity here uh, of reality. Uh, there's very few people that are going to argue that Harvard is a worse school than, say, Southwestern in Los Angeles. Mm. It, it just does more for you in terms of job outcomes. And that is often a big driver in the various rankings. Obviously, U.S. News is the biggest ranking uh, system out there. Mm -hmm. I don't actually love the U.S. News rankings. I think they're very soft. They do a lot of stuff on reputation that bothers me. Mm. Because they go out and they interview people in the field. Well, you know, if they heard Harvard was good, they may not know anybody really from Harvard. They may not know a whole lot about the school, but they heard it was good, so it must be good. Right. I don't like that kind of lack of exactitude in terms of making rankings. So you feel more it's like almost the visibility of a school as opposed to the reality of perhaps totally. your outcomes or something. Uh, it reminds me, you know, obviously I went to Duke as an undergrad. Right. And when Duke's basketball team 
you know, they've, they've always been good. Right. You know, even in the sixties and seventies, they, they competed at a high level, back but when, when they, what's that? I well, said back when you went, <laughs> no, I was not there in oh. the sixties and seventies, <laughs> but you know, in the 1980s, when they started winning more and then they were in the final four, I think six out of seven years, the visibility shot up of the school. And I noticed that the rankings went up too. So hmm. the, the relationship between kind of like this random visibility that schools get is is important look at gonzaga in basketball yeah they've slowly built themselves into a powerhouse and now a lot more people know about that school on the whole than they did previously but the the other ranking system that i actually prefer overall is the above the law ranking and the reason is actually kind of simple they're focused on outcomes they don't care what the LSAT score or GPA is of the incoming students. Yeah. They only care about what kind of jobs you received, um, you know, the, the nature of, uh, you know, what you were getting paid, all these different types of things that relate to how good is your outcome. Right. The cost benefit kind of ratio that you're looking for. Yeah. I have my complaints about their rankings. They, they include some stuff in there like the SCOTUS clerkships yeah. that I'm bother me i think it's only a five percent factor but still one wonders if it needs it doesn't need to be there yeah i I think they could have included something else or weighted something else a little bit more Mm. but i love the outcome oriented the other complaint i have about what they're doing is it's only 50 schools so if you're outside that top 50 they're not helping you yeah so and you and i have talked thrown around the idea of we should just create our own ranking based upon a slightly different set of outcome criteria and just do it for every school and see what happens. Yeah. So I might do that. Mine would be sometimes. heavily tilted towards um, weather, I think. <laughs> Sorry, Michigan. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know how quantitative that is. Sorry, Michigan. You're a great school, but no thank you. I like Michigan as a school. I'm as a, a school, fan. not as a three-year location. <laughs> you just don't like cold weather. That's right. Let's be honest about this. <laughs> So it might be worth it, depending upon the type of person you are. They've got a cool administration there, to obviously be sure. great facilities. To be sure. So part, I suppose I should take a brief moment and reflect on what we just did, which is that I indulged a little bit in personal preference. We'll get to that. But really, the focus of this early stage is not about personal preference. It's about trying to quantify objectively the things you can know about the various schools. We'll talk about how personal preference will play in. But this right now is trying to get as objective a measure as possible. In fact, the first question that's going to come up here in just a few minutes uh, deals with geography. Right. And, and a focus on New York and, and how that figures into the decision. Yeah. So Happiness is so subjective that we have to kind of set it aside for the moment. We'll get there. Yeah. It's, we can get quantitative at first, but when you start getting down to what are less clear choices, it's going to be your feelings that come in. Right. And so we'll, we'll come back to that because I think that's a really important point as well. Um, also, the debt is a big thing mm-hmm. that I think people should be looking at when you're making this decision. It is so easy to get caught up in, wow, that's the number six school in the nation. And I can't believe I'm going to be going there that you might ignore what it really costs to go there. Yeah. If you are paying the full amount to go to these schools, you are typically borrowing three hundred, three hundred fifty thousand dollars, possibly more, depending upon cost of living right. elements and so forth. And it's easy to think about, oh yeah, I can pay that off. And yeah, if you get a hundred eighty thousand dollar first year job in a, a big city, you, you can pay it off. That's really what the the, the gamble is that you're making. Right. But you should stop for a moment, put that money into a debt calculator and see exactly what it is going to cost you per month. Yeah. Because all of a sudden you see, you know, 3500 4100 per month and you begin to realize, whoa, that is a big amount. And if I don't get the job that pays a big six figure number, I'm going to be stretched. Yeah. And so for decades, potentially forever. You can be saddled. The thing to remember is that law school debt is non-dischargeable. It means you can't become, you can't go to bankruptcy court and say, I can't pay this. And it goes away. It never goes away. You will pay it. And this became very controversial to some extent around the time of the great recession, because when a lot of those grads came out and couldn't get jobs, they came back and they were like, be careful about debt. You don't want to take on this kind of debt without certain guarantees. And so that's something that you have to look at. And that's going to align with your goals as well, because right. if you're not the type of person who can deal with big law, 
and you can't work 100 hours a week and you say have two kids and a wife and that's just not going to work, then you need to think carefully about how much money you're actually spending. And that'll actually come up in, in one of the scenarios tonight as well. Yeah. So probably the last hardcore figure that I like to look at is cost of living because it costs more to live in New York City than it does to live in Durham, North Carolina. <laughs> and that's something that is easy to ignore, but also adds up very quickly. Yeah, this is three years of your life that you have to basically plan for. The school is easy to calculate, but the external factors obviously are a huge component as well. And I think sometimes people overlook that. Yeah. Once you have all these quantitative factors in place, that's when you start looking at the, the more personal factors. Uh, like you, I don't like cold weather. <laughs> so I probably wouldn't go to Michigan or Minnesota or Cornell or these schools that I consider to be a little bit more northerly that are going to make me suffer with snow a lot of the right. year. To be and fair, I don't like hot weather either. <laughs> I'm like a <laughs> 60 to 75 guy. If I can you're find a bland, place. mediocre person, is that what you're? That's me. You're claiming with my thin mitts. Yeah, <laughs> such a lukewarm. <laughs> <laughs> I want my thin mitts to freeze. Here. I don't want them to melt. I'm right in the middle. Uh, well, <laughs> either way, we'll post some debt calculators, and LST has the cost of living stuff, and the rest of it that kind of like personal factors. That's that's on you to look at right. when you're making these decisions. Do you like cold weather? Do you like a big city, or do you prefer small town living? Yeah. Um, do you want to not live in the southern part of the U.S., or do you really desire to live out west? These are the type of things that have a really big impact, and you have to think about you know, the environment, because I often tell people if it's really hard to determine between two schools, then the key is where do you think you're going to do better? Right. Because no matter what, this is built on performance. You can go to a great school, but if you have among the worst grades, it's not going to help you come job time. They'll look at it and be like, well, you went to a great school, but you did terribly. So you don't have what it takes. Right. And entirely and vice versa. You can go to a school that might be a little bit less reputable. But if you crush it, you're near the top of your class, you can actually come out of there way ahead of people who've done middling at a, a better, I'm doing air quotes, school. Yeah. And I so. think that's really, really important. And sometimes people have elements they don't even realize. Like you and I were talking about a student of yours who got a late admin to UCLA. <laughs> this happened last year, yeah. Yeah, what was the story Last there? summer, she took the June LSAT last year, did well, I think she got a 170. We'd been tutoring for a while, and she slowly climbed her way out of the 150s and uh, hit that magic number, 170. Hadn't applied anywhere yet, wasn't even sure she wanted to apply that late in the cycle, because a lot of it seemed almost impossible in the summer to apply to start that fall. And out of the blue, got a call or an email or something from UCLA. Uh, offering her a position in a class in their, I guess, 2018 group that started in about three weeks, maybe four weeks. It shocked her. I floored her, frankly, and she called me in something of a panic. Like, what do I do? Should I do it? Um, and as we kind of both calmed each other down, <laughs> talked our way through it, it uh, occurred to me that she didn't know anything about Los Angeles. Most specifically, she knew nothing about Westwood, and she didn't know how to drive. She was Canadian, had always just done public transit and commuted. And I said, look, this is, I, I don't want to make your decision for you. But if you're going to move to L.A., feeling comfortable on the road is probably a prerequisite. She, <laughs> to put it mildly, uh, I know there's some old song that you probably know better than I do about what is it? Nobody walks in L.A.? Nobody walks in L.A. by the missing persons. There you go. Couldn't have named the band, so well done, no. you. <laughs> Trivia star. Uh, but we talked it over, and she decided that even with the scholarship she was offered, again, completely out of the blue, that it wasn't the right decision for her. And she ended up at Cornell starting uh, this year, starting nice. this past fall. And it was the right decision for her, but it was one of those things where she could have really made a rash, venturesome, but rash decision to come to a place that was wholly unsuited for her. She would have adjusted. I think but so, too. You don't want to be adjusting in the first couple of weeks of law school. No. And I think, wasn't she from Toronto? Isn't that what you told me? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So. And so Cornell, you're not talking about something that's far, far away. This is a relatively close right. location to her. Pretty easy, back and forth, very similar to where she was, aside from the big city, small town aspect. Yeah. 
But you know, speaking of Cornell, I had another tutoring student last year who really debated after undergraduate at Cornell of whether he wanted to stay there for law school or whether I think it was actually Michigan was his other choice, whether he wanted to jump ship and go someplace new. And he was a little bit worried that staying put would reflect poorly on him. Like he wasn't ambitious enough or exploratory enough or curious enough or something. And the point that I made to him is, listen, you have the opportunity to start as grounded, as knowledgeable as possible. Your first month of law school in a place that you already know, you're going to be miles ahead of people who've come here for the first time. And if you can get off to the good foot, to a good start when it comes to the first semester of law school, which is just like indisputably brutal, then you're way ahead of the competition. And he ended up staying in Cornell, and he's doing really, really well and glad about his decision. But even little things like knowing a quick lunch spot, knowing where the library is or places you can go study, knowing some professors you can consult with or talk to, having friends in a support system, all of these things play a huge role. And I've talked to him uh, in the years since he started, and he said the same thing. He's like, dude, best thing I did was just staying put. So you don't have to be all Marco Polo about this and go exploring the great unknown. That to him was the right call. And that's the key. It's to you. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're making the selection decision, it's about what is going to work out best for you. And sometimes it's the more prestigious name school that is better. Sometimes it's not. Right. But keep in mind that underneath all of this is the expectation and the belief that you will perform at least well, if not great. And not everybody is going to be in the top 10% of the class. It would be <laughs> lovely definition. if they were. Um, yeah, what's the quote? Not Everybody wants to be a, everybody thinks they're above average. It's like, well, some of you aren't. That's right. So you have to, you know, be realistic about it. And the problem with law school is there is no way to prepare for the experience. You just get thrown in and it can be really tough to understand what it is that they want. And some people adapt to it really well and some people don't. And hopefully everybody listening is the type of person who's like adjust to it pretty quickly, does their research beforehand. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those are some of the factors to look at. It's really easy to talk about each one and say, okay, we went to this website and looked at this. We went to this website and looked at that. But it is, I think, much better to put it into action I agree. and make some decisions and play some scenarios with this. So let's play with some. Um, before we do, I'll make two quick things. Number one, remember that the numbers that we're about to talk about, guys, are variable. These things change year to year, cycle to cycle. So if we assign a ranking to a school or talk about some statistic, that is current as of now. But it might not be current if you're listening to this six months from now or a year from now or however long into the future. Um, the second thing is there is a degree of almost alchemy to this where the right decision or the suggested decision that we give is very individualized. Um, but not necessarily a guarantee that everyone who fits into these would make the same one necessarily. Would you say that's fair, Dave? A hundred percent. Okay. You can look at the exact same choice and for two people have a completely different outcome and it's going to change for them. And the other thing is, is that these numbers change year to year. So somebody might make a decision in 2016 and then the situation might be quite different in 2017. For sure. And that could be the same in 2020 and 2022 and so forth. You see movement and that is something that is worth taking a look at. It's not just what today's numbers are. What have they been doing? Have they right. been rising? Have they been falling? The legal market and the number of applicants, all these things change and it has an impact on the outcomes that law schools are able to produce. So keep an eye on those and in some respects, try to make a degree of prediction yeah. as to which direction you think things are actually going. Track the trends. But yes, indeed. To, to focus on prediction, I think a fun way to maybe do this, we're gonna look at five specific scenarios and then explore them and variations on those themes. But it might be kind of fun for anyone listening to this to pause after the scenario itself is described and see if they can actually guess what we're going to recommend, what we think the right choice would be. Or what they'd do. Or what they would do in yeah. this particular scenario. What factors would play in or how would you weigh them? So, Dave, if you'll let me um, put you somewhat on the spot here, the way I'm hoping we can do this, uh, since a lot of this is actually based off of content that you've already uh, either created or expressed, let me present some scenarios to you, and then you essentially react to them and give what you feel is the best advisement. 
All so, right. You keep looking I'm, that. I'm ready. We'll see which questions you pulled. Okay. <laughs> or scenarios. No, I love that I can actually put you on the spot with this, and you're just going to hang tight and nail it. That's As long as there's no further Robert Kraft references, we're great. Why do you keep bringing him back up? <laughs> <laughs> I can't help myself. There's not. I don't think. We'll see where it goes. Question number one. Here's the first one that I pulled, and I'm just going to quote directly from the question itself, and then you kind of walk me through what you would say in response. Uh, so, student says, applicant says, I was recently offered a $150,000, uh, I suppose, scholarship to USC and $105,000 to Fordham. Okay. Big difference there. I want to work at Big Law in New York. But I would be open to starting in L.A. first, USC, as long as there was a clear path to transferring that work to New York. If I were to be accepted to Penn as well, paying full tuition, which of these options seems like the smartest pick for someone who does like, uh, does like the idea of loans. I think he's misstated that. Does not like the idea of loans. Uh, and has started a family, but also wants all doors to remain open. So to summarize, three school options on the table, and let's just call it USC $150,000 scholarship. Fordham, 105, full sticker, as it were, at Penn, wants to work big law, wants to go to New York, willing to start somewhere else and move. What do you say to that person? Don't forget, he started a family. And has a family, but wants all doors to remain open. Yeah, let's not discount his family, although that is my tendency. I knew the school that was involved in this was Fordham, but geez, there's a lot to unpack. I know. Uh, when you're when you're looking at this. I didn't start it, with a softball, let me put it that way. No, no, but this is a great type of decision to actually face here because the schools are, especially if you look at the, like the U.S. news ranking, they're in different tiers. You know, you've got right. Penn, which is a top 10 school. USC is a top 20 school. Fordham's down in like the, the low 30s. And so you can see from a ranking standpoint that they have kind of like their own level in each right. case. But all three schools cost roughly the same. You know, these are all big private schools, well, you know, partially private schools that have fairly expensive costs. They're like $350,000, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars three forty for each one. And so we're not looking at a big difference on at least that number. And that's important. We have to start and know because if it, what the cost is, yeah. because if a school is significantly cheaper, then you might not get money there, but it still might end up being cheaper overall. Right. So that's where you start. Like, what's the total yeah. cost looking like? I would probably start with the comparison between USC and Fordham here, because doesn't the question actually say that he has those and then he's yes. hoping to be accepted to Penn? The question says there's an offer to USC and an offer to Fordham with more money at USC. In other words, okay. USC, uh, if all things being equal, would be cheaper. All right. And so the way I would look at this first off is to compare the employment outcomes and to not worry about the New York factor. Let's just look at how this would look from the standpoint of USC versus Fordham. I'm not going to worry about the fact that he wants to work in New York. Perfect. And I think we're going to see from a comparative standpoint, USC is going to look a lot more attractive. So statistically, USC has a slightly better employment placement um, rate than does Fordham. So LST actually uses a number called the LST employment score, mm -hmm. which is represents people who are employed full-time in long-term legal jobs. So in this case, USC is about 85.6% is their score. Fordham is 75 mm. So uh, 11% or so. Yeah, it's a very solid difference. Notable. It's not a statistical anomaly. Um, LST also uses an underemployment score. And John, we were talking about this before. <laughs> Remind me what that uh, was well, all about. It's a little murky. Whether or not that's intentional, I'm not sure. They don't uh, outline it perfectly well. I don't think that this includes all categories of non-legal track jobs because the numbers under employment and employment don't add up to 100% on the site. So, so clearly something's missing. Um, but that seems to reflect, in their description at least, people working in fields or in positions that don't necessarily further their legal career ambitions. I think what they've tried to do basically is weigh a desired outcome, the kind of thing that's going to help you pay off your debt or make the school seem worth it versus everything else. Exactly. And so in this case, you've got USC at 7.2% and you want a lower number here, whereas right. Fordham is at 11.7%. So right away, the 
numerical look at the types of jobs and just the job rates is better for USC. They're not all that different when you look at what are considered like the premier or elite jobs. And for me, those come down to two things, the the large firms, Mm -hmm. the so-called big law environment, and then ultimately the federal clerking rate. So let's take a look at those because the, the Big law score for them is virtually identical. Mm-hmm. USC's 41.1%, Fordham's 40.7%. And you can see why that would be the case. Fordham's in New York, and even though they're dealing with NYU and Columbia grads and people coming over from Boston, Fordham is an extremely well-respected school in New York, and they place pretty well there. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking for a big law job out in New York City, Fordham is a viable option. We'll see when we get to Penn that Penn dwarfs both of these schools <laughs> with that. The other interesting thing is this, is that from a federal clerkship rate, and these are very highly coveted jobs, USC strongly outperforms Fordham. There's 6.8% of grads got a federal clerkship, whereas only 25 of Fordham grads got that. And it's probably a competition issue, to be honest with you, a little bit less competition out west than there is right. in the northeast. So, again, USC is either comparable or slightly better. I look at the the numbers that you get from, say, LSAT and GPA just to look at your, your classmates look like. Mm-hmm. And, again, USC is slightly better, but not all that difference. For example, the median LSAT at USC is 166, at Fordham is 164. Medium GPA is 378, Fordham's 3.6. So a little bit better students in terms of like the actual metrics, the outcomes a little bit better. And then when I look at the fact that they cost about the same and you're getting more money at USC, just on that comparison, you'd have to start tilting towards USC if that's what your entire decision was actually being made on. So I like all those particular elements. So Let's get to the idea of the fact that this person wants to go to end up in New York eventually. Right. Um, both Fordham and USC place very large percentages of their graduates in the local area. I think Fordham's like 85 percent. USC is around 87 percent, although that's in New York and California. And you have to remember that USC graduates have the benefit not just of the Los Angeles legal market, that's but true. also the San Francisco legal market. And San Diego, San Jose, Sacramento, which, as we talked about the other day, is way bigger than I expected. Yeah, you don't get you get New York City, which is obviously massive. And so that's really where a lot of the folks are going. I'm sure there's some going into Albany and things like that. But uh, at least as far as that, they, they will place into a pretty similar rate in the surrounding state area. I tend to think of USC as having a slightly broader national reputation. And I hate to say it, but it probably relates to things like football. <laughs> you know, people know the USC Trojans. They're on television a lot. Fordham, they used to have a, a very famous football team years and years ago, uh, but not anytime recently. So you don't see them on television. They don't have that kind of knowledge where you go into a place like Philadelphia. It's it's pretty likely some if you said the University of Southern California, ever heard of it? Someone's going to be like, yeah, I have. Right, right. You go out to Los Angeles and you say Fordham, it's going to be a lot less uh, identifiable yeah. in that particular scenario. It's so, like you mentioned with Duke basketball before. That there's a certain exactly. visibility factor in this. That's why Alabama's football team's taking them straight Ivy League status, I think. <laughs> All of a sudden, a Alabama, Alabama, Alabama is number one so in law school right. rankings. Well, everybody in the country knows Alabama now. Sorry, Alabama. <laughs> Thanks, Nick Saban. <laughs> so if it's just USC and Fordham, USC takes it, right? Yeah, that's a clear victor right there. Perfect. All right, so Fordham's off the table. Let's put Penn into the mix. Now, granted, the question that was asked didn't have Penn as a certainty. The person hadn't been accepted yet, but the hypothetical was Penn full price, full sticker versus now what appears to be just the solo USC with a $150,000 scholarship. Okay, so this is a more interesting kind of comparison in, in some respects, because now we're getting more to the essence of this prestige versus scholarship For sure. uh, debate that we, that we kind of want to hone in on here. And from a ranking standpoint, USC is ranked 19th by both U.S. News and Above the Law. Penn is 7th with U.S. News. It's 6th with Above the Law. So you can see that there is a definitive difference between yeah. these two. 
And one of the things you always notice when you look at the top schools is that their numbers tend to be extremely strong. Mm -hmm. So USC was 85.6% on the employment uh, metric from LST. And again, that's law school transparency. That's very strong. Penn is 90.6. So they're basically saying, you you, you know, 90% of you are going to come out with jobs that are what you wanted them to be. Right. Most interestingly is the underemployment score because USC shows that there's some weakness here. 7.2% of the students didn't really have things work out in the direction they wanted. Mm -hmm. For Penn, it's 0.8. Wow. So it is less than 1%. That's really strong because they are basically saying if you come here, you're going to end up with a long-term legal job for the most part. Yeah, it's all but guaranteed. Not guaranteed, but close to it. Yeah, and that crystallizes really what we're talking about here because it's that close to guaranteed scenario, which is what you are paying about one hundred and fifty or one hundred and sixty thousand dollars more for. That was going to be my next question: is what is the cost difference, though? One hundred and sixty or so, right? Yeah, Penn is about ten thousand dollars more for the so-called non-discounted ca- uh, cost, and so you add that to the one hundred and fifty thousand dollars from USC, and now you're looking at about one hundred sixty thousand or so. Makes and, sense. You know, you can always save a little bit more depending upon where you go and these types of things. But you're paying that amount to go to Penn as a differential, and this is what you're getting for it is a better outcome from a job standpoint. Let's compare something else, too. Mm-hmm. Let's compare both the, the big law uh, employment and the federal clerkship employment because this will show you the quality of the jobs because the people who hire into big law and federal clerkships are typically the most in demand, the highest level, the most desirable graduates. So the big law for USC was about 41%. Mm-hmm. For Penn, 67.6. Wow. So two thirds of their grads are going into big law. So if you have that as your focus, your chances are significantly better, 27% better by going to Penn. And the federal clerkship rate is also significant. Again, USC was 2.9%, Penn, 10.9%. So if you want to work for a federal judge, which is often the passport to a lot of incredible options later on in your career... 10% of your your class is going to go in and work in those positions uh, if you go to Penn. That's pretty powerful. You add those two together and you can see why their employment score is so high. They're able to hire a huge percentage of people into big law and Mm -hmm. into federal clerkships. So here now the decision is, is really challenging. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it really comes down to how this person feels about debt. I personally tend to be fairly debt averse, mm-hmm. but if I have a degree of confidence in my ability to perform at least pretty well at Penn, I don't have to be at the very top, but in the middle, I'll probably have a, a really strong outcome. I can go to USC and kill it and do fantastically well. But this is a good example where you can see how much it's going to cost you, but you can also see what it is that you're actually buying in terms of opportunity. So he's probably got to sit down with his family and decide, well, do you want to live in LA? Mm -hmm. And as you and I know, a lot of people who go to USC law school actually live over towards Westwood. That's right. (laughs) So that's an interesting factor to consider. (laughs) Uh, the, The neighborhood around USC has some areas that aren't you know, optimal. Yeah, it's, for a, a, it's family. a bunch of like UCLA adjacent people commuting down to USC back and forth. Yeah. You you'll have plenty of your classmates and from USC law yeah. school living, trying on, to get out the of there before side. dark. <laughs> <laughs> so it can be a tough neighborhood at yeah, times. So I think when you look at that, I'd probably tend towards Penn. But if somebody said no, USC is the better choice, I would com- I wouldn't object to that. I right. would say that's pretty fair. This is where things become, I think, personal. Uh, ultimately, where do you want to live? The soft factors, as it were. Um, what school kind of environment suits you better? And I think that actually, as someone with a former student who's now at USC, having transferred after one year at Southwestern, I can speak very quickly to the notion of just the, the student body, the ethos, the composition, um, the vibe that you get in these various places actually has a huge, huge impact on your experience there. Specifically, my buddy, he's he's a little older, former student of mine, good friend of mine now. I think he's 32 or 33. 
crushed it his first year at Southwestern. I won't say he had a great time because it's your first year of law school, but he made a lot of friends. He did really well, had a lot of great relationships with professors. So well, in fact, that he was able to transfer both his credits and his scholarship up, big time up, to USC for starting his second year. Nice. Yeah. I don't want to pretend like that's a common thing, of course. Um, that it happens at all, I think, is encouraging for people who maybe don't start exactly where they want to. But his experience at USC has been very different. The people there, I think, on the whole are younger, less friendly. He's found it to be just a far less like accommodating, I don't know, um, social vibe, I suppose. Less chill. It's much less chill. <laughs> it's much less competitive, or much more competitive. High stress, intense. He says all the people do there is basically ignore you and work. Uh, whereas Southwestern, yeah, they're having parties and social gatherings and cookouts and all sorts of stuff. I went to a couple with him, um, which is maybe not my most fun Friday nights, but he's found it to be a very different scene. And while he's glad he made the transfer, the prestige in this case actually does win out. I think if he had to do it all over again, he would say, like, I wish I could have a school like Southwestern with the reputation of a USC, if that makes sense. That's hard to get. Yeah, well, that's exactly. Those two tend to work against one another. Yes, they do. But it's a good example, I think, of someone in that position where there truly is no clear winner. They need to go experience lifestyle, basically, in both places. And you actually bring up an interesting point, and it's a sidebar, but I'm going to take it anyway. Yeah, no, take it. And that is, is that one of the things that I never assume is that you can go to a school and transfer mm. to another school. Um, sometimes I see people ask me questions where they're like, well, I'm going to take this because the, the scholarship is full and then I'm just going to transfer after the first year. And I always tell students, don't attend a school that you wouldn't be happy graduating from because there is no guarantee in life that you're going to have a good mix with law school mm -hmm. and that you're going to do well enough to transfer. Certainly there are plenty of transfers out there. Some schools are notorious for taking transfers. Mm -hmm. Georgetown, for example. Yeah, Georgetown's a good example of that. Yeah, they're the perfect ones. In fact, some of the other D.C. area schools have complained about how many <laughs> transfers they take. But at the same time, if law school just doesn't jive with you and you're not really comfortable and you don't do as well as you hope, you will be stuck, so to speak, at that first school. So don't ever assume that, hey, I'm just going to slam it and I'm going to be able to transfer. Maybe. And if so, then you can take a look at that decision and hopefully you've got some great options. But you can't presume that that's going to occur. And if that doesn't occur, that means that you're going to end up graduating from that original school. So you want to make sure that the time that you're spending and any money that you're spending is worth it to you and that you're going to be happy with that type of outcome. That's right. Yeah, graduating from that first school as a best case scenario. If you're so miserable that you actually can't succeed at all, then you're just going to have wasted a bunch of money and time. That's exactly yeah, right. With no degree to even show for it. So you know, when you commit to these things, and it's kind of why I think you and I really linger on these topics as much as we do, make sure you're making the right decision as best you can. This is uh, a big gamble, as it were. It's a big financial gamble That's in right. many instances. Yeah. It can be. That's right. Well, all right. So in that case, Penn and USC, we'll call it a tie until the person, him or herself, uh, gets to weigh in on other factors that might swing the needle a bit. Let okay. Me, let me give you another one where we can gamble on it. Question <laughs> two, scenario two. Ready? All right. All right. Student says, I was offered a full tuition to, here we go again, to Penn State, uh, Wait, this is Penn State. Sorry, different school. I was offered a yes. full tuition to Penn State Law School, ranked number 74 at the time. I also went there for my undergrad. I was also offered half tuition at University of Connecticut, ranked number 50. I know UConn has a much better employment outlook. However, I feel like it's tough to tell where Penn State will be in the near future since they split from Dickinson so recently. Uh -huh. hmm. uh, I don't particularly care where I work, per se, so there's that. But I would like to end up in a coastal town. No dreams of big law here either. So again, a lot to unpack. Let me break it down in bullet points for the listener who might be trying to do some anticipatory guessing. Predictions. Yes. Penn State, 74th ranking, full tuition. Undergrad as well, so they know the area. Half tuition at UConn, ranked 50. Um, Again, as it kind of goes down, PSU breaks from Dickinson. That seems more like a bit of historical trivia. I don't know how relevant that is. I don't particularly care where I work, 
so it doesn't seem like a big law drive necessarily, but does want to end up in a coastal town, so no flyover states. Uh, no dreams of big law here either, just kind of reinforces it. Okay. Balls in your court. <laughs> Well, that's an interesting one. The, the Penn State, the University Park versus the Dickinson thing, mm -hmm. two different kind of uh, areas of focus there. Obviously, if you go to the University Park, you're, you're on the main so-called Penn State campus, mm. you know, Saturday football and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the Dickinson campus is a newer one that is a little bit more business focused. I think it's by Harrison, Harrisburg. And so kind of like a different type of students that they're really – trying to get. But, but the thing that's been interesting about Penn State is it seems like the university administration has been putting some resources into the law school in the last several years. Mm -hmm. And they've they've seen a, a bit of a rise in rankings. And I actually think that's going to continue. So interesting. Kind of reinforces what you said earlier about tracking trends. Yeah, this is a, you know, if you think about it, it's Penn State. This is a big state university system with a a fair amount of money behind it. Obviously, some states are a little bit, uh, you know, more fiscally conservative. Right. But it's not as if they're going to run out of money tomorrow. They're going to have money to to put into this. And if you really want to make a statement on, uh, you know, the grad school level, the law school is certainly one of those areas that you can do that. Mm -hmm. So the key here, you look at the ranking difference, 74 versus 50, and neither of those schools are ranked on above the law. Right. Which Again, above the law only takes their top 50, which UConn didn't make in this Didn't case. make, which is irritating to me. This is why I, I'm, I swear I think we're just going to make our own rankings. So and then I have something that I can look at <laughs> when I'm making these, uh, <laughs> these types of choices so you can actually see what's happening with the outcome stuff. But let's go there first because we know we have a ranking difference. It's not huge. Let's try to figure it out. So let me pull up LST here and compare UConn and... Penn State Do it. at the University Park. When you say not huge, I mean, there is a 24 spot difference in U.S. news rankings. Are you suggesting that maybe once you get out of the top 20, 30, 50, that the differences matter less? You know, that's a great clarification you just made because I am. Um, 27 or 24, 24 places yeah. of difference when it's number seven to number 31, that to me is massive. Right. But when we get down into that like second 50, the differences, if they're under 25, I don't see them as being really huge. Gotcha. Now, 51 versus 95, okay, that's a pretty significant difference. But this isn't so great that I immediately am like, oh, go for the number 50 school. Also, the second thing is this, it's number 50. Right. It's not by itself commanding this national position where people are like, wow, that's a school I recognize. If this is 74 versus 20, yeah. you're going to see a completely different footprint in terms of a national position versus a regional position. Yeah. Or if you took the 24 in the other direction, did 26 versus 50. I don't know what the 26th ranked school would be, but mm -hmm. if you were to do that, then that's a huge difference, much more significant than what we're seeing here. Agreed. Now, employment-wise, interestingly enough, UConn is 64.7. Mm -hmm. Penn State, 67.2. How about that? So it did slightly better in that. Its underemployment score, though, is also higher. Um, UConn's 13.7, Penn State's 16.4. Not that big a difference, frankly. Yeah, not huge. When you look at, like, the big law relationship, once again, UConn actually does better here. They're 13.7 versus 4.9 for Penn State, which is extremely really low. low. Yeah. That's a reflection of the ranking here. When you're down into the 70s, you're not pulling a lot of like top level jobs. Yeah. Although the clerkships at Penn State, 4.9% versus 1.3 on the Fed level. Mm -hmm. for but to UConn. reiterate this particular student's query, the last sentence is no dreams of big law. So they're not, it's, it's not killing them. Right. So at least when I look at it from the perspective of like the prestige, if they went to Penn State, they're not, they may not want one of those jobs. They're probably not going to end up with one. Mm -hmm. You're talking about 10% of the graduating class going into that, in fact, slightly under that. So it's going to be a lot more of like public service and things of that nature. And if that's where your focus is, fantastic. You know, something like Penn State would work out great and it's cheaper. So much cheaper. Yeah. I think just in loans, a lot. the cost of living in both is about the same, I would guess. 
but I think the difference in tuition is probably about 60 grand. It's, it's actually more significant than you'd expect, but given the full tuition and everything that they've worked out, they it, obviously the difference that they've assessed is that UConn is going to cost 60000 more. Right. For me, I don't see the value in it. So in if, this instance, you're Penn State. I'd probably go with Penn State. And again, Connecticut versus Pennsylvania, you know, this person might have s- strong feelings about certain things that I don't know. That's the kind of stuff that we would probably want to go into a little bit more. The coastal town stuff, I'll be honest, I find that to be an (laughs) unusual. Then why are we talking about these two schools? Because they are not true coastal cities. (laughs) You know, (laughs) you're you're deciding between two schools that actually aren't coastal. Fairly landlocked, Um, yeah. Yeah, you need to. And it's funny because I don't think of D.C. as a coastal town, but certainly it qualifies it given does. its location. So I'm not going to worry about the coastal aspect, but at least we're not putting them out in Kansas or <laughs> Iowa or, or something like that. All those no offense schools are to out. you Iowans out there. Hey, I'm from Minnesota, so plenty go. of offense to Iowans. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. And Wisconsinites while we're at it. Uh, fair enough. It's all, it's all in jest. <laughs> but yeah, for me, I'd got probably... No beef with anybody. I'd take the money and run here yeah. and head towards Penn State and save the $60,000. I don't see that the employment outcomes are so much better or even better at UConn to justify and it. And it's a Penn State undergrad applicant as well, so she can just sit tight. It's comfortable there, I'm sure. Sounds like it. All right. Um, nicely done. Thank nicely you. Nicely done. So that one actually had what I think is a pretty clear winner. Um, I'm going to really flip the script on you here. Let's go with scenario three. We'll see where we land with this. So in this case, it was actually a question submitted by a parent about his or her daughter. We get a lot of those. Yeah, we do. Which is nice. It's nice to see, I think, some family support, some family involvement to, a, to an extent. <laughs> <laughs> no helicopter parents. Yeah, that's right. So it says, my daughter is trying to decide between sticker price, here's the first option, at University of Miami and Loyola in Los Angeles. There's two, full price. Uh, mm. And uh, so University of Miami and Loyola are the first two. And a full tuition scholarship to Capital University, which is an unranked regional school in Ohio. I don't believe she has her sights set on big law firms. It's a little ambiguous. But wants to have a stable, well-paying career nonetheless, of course. As do we all. I mean, right. Good insights, Mom. So it goes on to say, the free cost of tuition at Capital is nice because it's close to home. And on top of the 50K plus spent at Loyola and Miami, the two cities offer some of the highest living costs. Miami and Los Angeles, obviously not cheap to settle into. So there are your really three options, but it's kind of a category of two versus one. Yeah, I mean, she cites 50,000 plus, but let's just take a look at the actual cost of those schools. Yeah, I and think again, the emphasis here is going to be on the plus. <laughs> oh, geez. It's like, once again, you get that idea of like, oh, it's just 50000 a year. But when you add everything else in, yeah, that is not it at all. Loyola Marymount, the Los Angeles school, mm-hmm. is about $340,000 a year. Or, geez, Whoa. that would be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I live it's here, the, and even I flinched at that. It's the worst deal in history. <laughs> No, for the full three years, cost of living, everything, about $340,000. Okay. Uh, Miami, $300,000. Okay. So $40,000 difference. When you're talking full sticker, it's not 50000 a year. It's closer to 100 and 100 plus. Well, there's still cost of living at wherever in Ohio, Capital University. Yes. But. And Capital is going to be 217 so significantly cheaper. But Columbus, Ohio, which is where Capital is located, is also going to be... Yeah be cheaper overall yeah. so so the 217 is that the tuition is that what you're yeah okay. it's the it's the so-called non-discounted cost which is gotcha. if you're going to go there this is what it is going to cost you in total right so it's going to remember full tuition to capital no 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 free tuition at capital it's I a full should. tuition scholarship so she's right. still going to pay some cost of living stuff but right when i, I say full tuition, that I the scholarship a, not the cost sorry yeah it's just a comparative thing to be like it's actually cheaper gotcha. if you were to look at them and full price so in this instance what i would probably do first is i would pull out all the statistical stuff from miami and loyola mm-hmm. let's try to make a decision there and then we'll take that remaining school and then put it up head to head versus capital i like it because this is one of those decisions where it's like wow 
it kind of really encapsulates the entire idea of do I go for the better name or bigger name, better rank school versus, in this case, a much lower unranked school, which has had some issues that is going to cost us less. Right. And of course, as a parent, they're like, it's also close to home. (laughs) Which you kind of get that hopeful note in there, like, please tell her to stay. Yeah, there was a a glimmer in the mom's eye for capital, for sure. Um, This is reminiscent of question one, where USC trumped Fordham, but then had to compete against Penn, and it was a little murkier there. Let's see what happens here. Yeah, so let's just take a look at Miami versus Loyola. And we've already seen that Loyola will probably cost you about 40000 more. Um, let's just go right into LST again, Law School Transparency, and take a look at the employment scores. Miami, 73.8. Loyola, 66.2. Also, Loyola has a higher underemployment score, which is worse. That's 17.7 versus Miami's 13.8. Mm-hmm. The big law school... Placements are roughly the same, even the small firms within 5%. Um, it turns out that Loyola does a little bit better on the federal clerkship rate, but it's not huge. Okay. And I'll point something out that when I do these analyses for real, I don't just use these main numbers. I go further into it. I take a look at all the clerkships. Sure. Because if somebody's getting a lot of state clerkships, there's value in that too. I'm just using these because otherwise this podcast would be three hours to four hours long tonight. I mean, and so I'm just rate. using kind of like the main things. This rate, we might get there anyway. Yeah, e- even the input side stuff with the LSAT and the GPA, Loyola and, and Miami are pretty similar. So um, I probably just on the numerical side of things would say that Miami looks a little bit better to me overall. It's not a huge difference, but the 40000 less for slightly better outcomes seems to be something that would tilt me in that direction. Gotcha. And at that point, it really is going to come down to how you feel about – um, Miami mm-hmm. versus, versus LA. Yeah. And remember where, you know, Loyola is. So it's not, it's not exactly the same, but anyway, so that would probably be where I would go. Now we've got Miami. We'll just say, okay, we've, she's decided on Miami and now it's Miami versus capital. So Here's where I think things get interesting because obviously capital is going to be significantly less, but there's a reason for that. And this is the difference that you would be paying for or saving. Um, the employment score at capital, 47.9. Ooh. That's not good. Uh, the underemployment, 22.2%. That's a lot of not positive outcomes right. coming out of there. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily, if I recall, she wasn't saying that big law was, was her big deal or anything like that. But The quote is, I don't believe she has her sights on big law firms, but wants to have a stable, well-paying career. Yeah. And Which, it's not a huge difference. 14.2 for Miami, 6.8 for Capital. Probably some jobs in Columbus and, and maybe going over Chicago those and so Those are big forth. law statistics. Uh, yeah, they are. Zero percent on the federal clerkship rate if you go to Capital. It tells you something. You're not getting pulled into that system. And those jobs are some of the most premium ones out there. Uh, They're just not rating on that scale. Judges aren't looking at at capital and thinking, okay, this is the way to do it. The input, the student body, and we go back to your Southwestern versus USC discussion. Mm. Um, The median LSAT score at capital is 149. At Miami, it's 158. So you're seeing kind of a difference there. And then there's a number down here on the comparison that actually jumps out to me as very worrisome for capital. The 1L attrition rate, Mm. so the number of people who leave during or at the end of the 1L year, Mm -hmm. at Miami, it's it's 0.7, so it's less than 1%. You're not losing too many of your classmates. Try the what? capital rate is 15.3%. 15.3? 15.3. Oh, my God. Now, seeing a number like that, what I would probably do is I'd pull up their 509 and go deep into the attrition numbers and try to figure out exactly who's leaving and why. Mm-hmm. It's not going to give me reasons, but it's going to tell me something. And then I'd probably call the school and be like, explain. Yeah, how are you losing one in seven your first year there? Yeah, it's, it's truly uh, disconcerting for me to see that number. So what are you paying for if you go to Miami and and you pay the higher rate? Well, somewhat better employment outcomes, certainly in in certain instances, much better, a lot more stability. 
yeah. in terms of who you're actually being, you know, you're going to school with. When you're losing 15% of your class, that really bothers me. And it's interesting. Somebody asked me a question a while back, and they had a full ride offer to North Carolina Central. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I said to them was, I realize how attractive that is, but you need to go take a look at the North Carolina Central University Law School with in, in relation to the ABA standards and accreditation because they are having problems. And the last thing you want to do is get yourself into a situation where you go to a law school that yeah. then goes on probation and possibly conceivably is closed down at some point. Yeah, it gets shuttered your second year and you've spent money on nothing. Now you're embroiled in lawsuits and things. It's yeah. As we've Sometimes, seen, it's happened. It's a mess. Yeah, you could when you look at the schools here, Miami's rated sixty fifth by US News, as is Loyola Marymount. Mm -hmm. Um Capital's not. It's not rated at all, which means it's outside US News's top one hundred and forty six law schools. You're heading down towards the bottom at that point. And you can go to schools in that range and have great outcomes right. and do just fine. However, go in with your eyes open and be aware of what you're looking at. Here, 15% attrition rate, that just drives me crazy. It's, Let me ask two follow-up questions to this because I'm curious to get your take. That 15% attrition rate isn't necessarily just people who couldn't hack it. Um, it could also include transfers out and presumably up. Right. Yeah. So is there a way to actually break that 15 percent into its component pieces and say, oh, well, that's actually because 11 percent of people transferred to a better school? You know, I th I'm pretty sure there is. I don't have that right in front of me, so I can't pull it up and be like, oh, this is what happened. Do you think a school would release that information if you were to call and put them to the point? They'll tell you how many transfers there were. Okay. If it's not stated exactly, you can figure it out. Gotcha. Because they tell you exactly how many, what, what the number of people were that left. So if you then can figure out the transfer number, which is available, you can kind of cross-reference those two. Note that this is the 1L attrition rate. Yeah. Um, there are schools out there that have 2L attritions as well, where they lose students in the second year. So this isn't the whole of it. No. Yeah, that degree of instability is uh, terrifying, Frank. <laughs> I, it, it bothers me because when you look at a lot of the schools that are really towards the top, you see a high level of stability. Mm -hmm. And the better schools, they want to retain their students. They don't want them to leave. They don't want you to fail out. And they will do everything within their power to try to make sure that you make it through. Yeah. They incentivize that's, permanence, as it were. Yeah, That's awesome because that's a huge level of support. For so. Sure. I'm not saying that capital is is a clearly wrong choice here. What I'm saying is it requires a lot closer of a look because there are some things that are slightly worrying for me when I look at it. Yeah. Well, my second follow-up question is really about the nature of either unranked schools. I'm not going to talk about unaccredited schools because that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. But schools in the 100-plus kind of ranking range, you talked about people that go there could have great outcomes, and that's undeniable. It's true. Sure. There are success stories from every school. Um, Michael Cohen went to Cooley, and he did really well for a while. So, <laughs> A while. <laughs> <laughs> he had his moment in the sun. But what uh. are the factors you think would justify a school like Capital? What are the things that maybe would motivate someone with good reason um, to have a good outcome there or to expect to have a good outcome in a place like Capital? Well, the first thing we need to do is, is to get the daughter on the phone here mm -hmm. and say, tell us what it is you're really seeking, because your mom's not entirely certain. <laughs> she doesn't think that you want big law. But uh, for example, let's say somebody's family owned a law firm mm -hmm. and they knew that they were going to be a lawyer and they just needed the degree. And they knew that they were, were going to learn everything that they needed to from from dad or mom or whoever was running the firm you know that's a great example of where it's like okay you could go there it has no impact really where you get your degree you're already yeah. kind of set yeah a lot of times you see this in business as well as where a business will say hey if you get a law degree we'll put you in this pathway and if it's a columbus based business they might be like yeah capital's great go right ahead and do that we've got plenty of capital people here right. we're completely happy it's with not it. always nepotism but no, occur. it's not. Or, you know, having a, a wealthy family that has set you up. There's those are just examples of where you might want to look at something and think, OK, it, it, it would work out just fine. It also depends upon the geography of certain areas. Mm -hmm. Like in Minneapolis, for example, the University of Minnesota is clearly the so-called best law school. Mm -hmm. But 
that area doesn't have a whole lot of law schools. And so when someone goes to, say, uh, William Mitchell, the Mitchell Hamlin Law School, their chances in Minneapolis are a little bit better than if they were down in Chicago because there's more competition in Chicago from really good law schools. Makes sense. You know, I remember teaching in Minneapolis, and a lot of times students would say, it doesn't matter which school I go to because I know I'm going to be in a good position. Mm -hmm. And that was years ago, and it's changed. But it reflected the Minneapolis legal market and the lack of competition from law school graduates at that time. Gotcha. You now have St. Thomas that's added in there and, and, and made it a little bit more competitive. But you never would have heard somebody in Los Angeles say that or New York or Chicago because right. the landscape was totally different. So it's a little more palatable perhaps to go to a what we'd call a regional school if you know that you want to stay there and work there and that the network you make is going to be sufficient despite the maybe smaller radius. Yeah, if you want to stay in Macon, Georgia, obviously everybody knows Mercer there. Yeah, well, so that's all there is to know in Macon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had a student several years ago who was determined that she wanted to practice um, a historical conservation law. And so she chose Charleston School of Law, despite the fact that prestige is not necessarily associated with, with those folks. I love the school. I like a lot of the people there, but they're not a nationally known school, to be sure. They're still working. Yeah. But it made a lot of sense for her to actually, she lived there, her family was there, she'd gone undergrad to College of Charleston. It made a lot of sense for her to just stay put, take the scholarship, study there, because Charleston's a super old city, as you know, and there's a lot of work to be found in that particular field. Yeah, and it's also one of the coolest towns in America if you've never been. Yeah, I cannot recommend Charleston highly enough. Um, yeah. Stay away in, say, July and August, but other than that, it's amazing. Ah, a little heat never hurt anybody. I don't know, man, it's awfully sticky, but... <laughs> But um, it's a good example, I think, of the factors that could actually motivate you to a less reputable, as it were, school, uh, especially if you can save some money. But those factors are few and far between, or they're very specific, I should say. Yeah, it's, it's going to get to a personal level. In, in the case of Capital versus Miami, there's no guarantees either way. I don't love paying full ride um, or full tuition at Miami. Yeah. That bothers me. Uh, I want to see some kick in from the school to entice me down there. So I don't love this choice really at all. And there's certainly, you know, no guarantee that going to capital and paying less is going to work out either. Right. And there's plenty of possible issues there, but we need to get her in here and be like, tell us more about what it is that you want to practice. Do you want to go into public interest law? Okay. Then you're going to want to keep your debt as low as possible. Then capital might make a much better choice. We've got a lot of different ways to go here and it's really hard for us to figure that out without knowing a little bit more about her personality and, you know, even does she want to get away from mom and dad and get to Miami? <laughs> Maybe she wants to party all the time. I don't know. Got options. There you go. Um, so this scenario, I think of the three we've looked at so far, is probably the most individualized, would you say? This is the yeah. one where the decision is much more based on the individual as opposed to the pure statistics. She's got to figure out who she is and what her type is. And yeah. make it from there. Well, we got a song at the beginning that I think is her tune. <laughs> Let me see if we can get back to making more firm decisions. I don't know that that's going to happen here, but I'm, I'm going to throw a fourth scenario at okay. you. Uh, if you've still got the, I'm ready. the gumption. All right. So here we go. First off, and I've included this specifically, it starts with a compliment. What an appropriate article for the thousands of students who are grappling with this very question Exclamation point. So echoing, I'm sure, the sentiments of any reader. The question is, I'm wrestling between a full ride with a stipend and health care, which is really rare, to the University of Tennessee, which is ranked 65th, another 65th ranking, uh, or sticker price admittance of 55000 uh, plus to Emory Law in Atlanta, Georgia, which is ranked 22nd. I moved to Tennessee to attend undergrad and have since gotten married, so I will likely remain in the region, though not necessarily Tennessee, to practice. I was lucky enough to have a full ride for my undergrad, and my husband and I currently have no debt. And then, what do you think, is the question itself. So again, bullet points, there's Tennessee with a full ride and stipends, healthcare things, which is really uh, unusual, 65th ranked school, or full sticker at Emory, which is ranked 22 in Atlanta, no debt, recently married, lives in Tennessee at the moment, is going to stay in the region to practice. 
So number 65 versus number 22. Yep. But okay. full ride at the first and truly full ride. There's even additional stipends in there. Yeah, that's a killer deal yeah. with a stipend in healthcare. Well, let's go see what the value of that difference is. Because once again, someone's quoted, oh, it's 55000 at Emory <laughs> each year. Non-discounted costs for Emory, about $300,000. So we're looking at close to, you know, there's still going to be some cost of living above that stipend if they want to go out and have dinner as a couple every sure. once in a while. But she gets a health care and yeah. stipend. Okay. So she's, she's looking good. So we're going to say a very low number versus $300,000. Is the, the bigger name, the better ranking actually worth it? And this is, this is the kind of battle that I really like. It's Me a nice too. Southern regional battle. <laughs> uh, and Emory is one of those schools that everybody in the South knows about. And a lot of people outside of the South know about Emory. It's kind of like getting there when it comes to a national reputation. Washington University in St. Louis is another school that's getting there. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the know in the law knows these schools, but not everybody in the legal field is overly familiar with them. And certainly a lot of people outside the legal field are not familiar with those two schools. Yeah. As a guy from Atlanta in undergrad, I can tell you Emory's got a great reputation. Now I'm a oh, little yeah. spoiled because I was there, but... It's a cool school. I really like the campus. They've got some serious money backing some of the schools there. Uh, so I'm actually an Emory fan just on the surface of it. I think it's yeah, a really same. quality institution, and it's it's getting better every year. They put a lot of time and effort into trying to craft something that's really high quality. So now they're faced with, you know, the Tennessee behemoth. <laughs> uh, so if this was football, it's game over. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure but, Emory could even field a team. Yeah, we, we can see the cost differential. 300000 for Emory versus a relatively minimal amount for Tennessee. That is going to be a big mountain to overcome as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Because, again, I'm not a big debt fan, and if I'm going to go into debt, there better be something that is a crystal clear advantage that I am deriving from that in terms of job outcomes mm -hmm. and directions I can take once I graduate. Well, the question doesn't mention any desire or ambition in terms of type of practice or type of work. So let's look at this broader, I think. Let's talk, as I'm sure you're about to do, about what the job outcomes look like. Yes, that's exactly where we're going. So let's start with the, you know, the LST employment score. Emory, 71.5%. Not bad, not fantastic. Tennessee, again, think about the monetary difference here. Mm -hmm. A couple hundred thousand dollars. Tennessee, 69%. 71 to 69? Yeah. <laughs> that's... Not amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You have, a, you have a gift for modesty when it comes to it. <laughs> now we go to the underemployment score. Emory, 13.2. Tennessee, 8%. So Tennessee actually doing a little bit better. That's likely going to be because a lot of the Tennessee grads went into jobs that were maybe for smaller firms or public interest. Um, and so they ended up getting jobs, but maybe not the optimal jobs. Mm -hmm. The big loss scenario, this is where Emory shows some of its power. 28.8% for Emory, only 12% for Tennessee. Hmm. Probably a function of Atlanta. That's in Atlanta. Largely yeah. for Emory, big market. Tennessee doesn't have that same kind of legal market, and so they're not able to hire in. And, and certainly, you know, there's competition in Georgia because the University of Georgia is an excellent law school as well. An hour away, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, when we look at clerkships the, on the federal level, Tennessee actually outperforms Emory 6% to 3.1. Wow. So Would not have guessed that. Not what you'd expect, but again, it could be the location, the circuit where people are being pushed into. It's really hard to tell. I, I, if we go into this more deeply, we can figure out the reason why. We can take a look at where the Tennessee grads are going, and that'll kind of make the connection for us. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to go that deep right now. But if Again, if you were researching this, that's exactly what you would want to do. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because we just talked about the attrition rate at Capital being 15%. Let's just, as a comparison, take a look at Tennessee and Emory. <laughs> Poor Emory's capital. attrition rate, <laughs> zero. Yeah. Zero percent. Tennessee's, 0 0.9. So they're both under 1%. This shows you what, like, quality, stable law schools look like. Yeah. They don't lose their students. They keep them something to think about. 
So just on those elements right there, yeah, there's a big rankings difference, 65 to 22. But but is that 22nd ranking worth several hundred thousand dollars more based upon the outcomes? It doesn't really look like it. If you are absolutely committed to big law and you're like, I must get that big law job. Okay. Yeah. Emory gives you a better than double ad advantage in terms of getting that. But you are paying a very high price. Yeah to to grasp that opportunity and to secure it probably for me i would say tennessee for most people is going to be the better choice here financially in the long term unless there's something particularly compelling either about atlanta or exclusively big law yeah i think tennessee has to win this one yeah i'm a i love atlanta as a town i think there's a lot of great areas it's i love the south in general um i'm less of a fan of tennessee but that's mostly because i haven't spent a lot of time there that's fair. So I'm not, uh, it's not a knock on Knoxville that I've only been through there like one time. No, it's okay. You and I have had a night or two in Nashville, so I know it's not all bad times. No, I like Nashville. <laughs> we actually saw Muse there at yes, the, we uh, did. what was called the Bridgestone Center at that time. Yes, we did. That's good times. What, what's, the, what's the street, the, the big Broadway? Nashville's? Yeah, yeah. that's a cool, cool street. I spent Christmas in Nashville just this couple months ago. Well, your sister lives there. She does indeed. Yeah. My very, very pregnant sister. <laughs> with her apparently excellent chef husband who is uh, yeah. a chef yeah, she's, of some note in that she's area. She's got it pretty good. Yeah. So, well, that baby's got it really good. <laughs> They're going to eat it well. to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I've yeah, already been so, dubbed Uncle Fun. We'll see if, uh, I, can, if I can live well, up to it. Well, that's a really good title to actually have. No, Funkle. So Ready for, I would, yeah, go ahead. So this just one. finishing this out, I take it for me, probably Tennessee over Emory. In most instances, there'd have to be something specific that someone was looking for, or they'd have to have a real desire to be like, I need to go to the biggest name school because I have plans that are going to rely upon something like gotcha. that. I think it's fun to play with these competitive factors, despite the fact they're not included too. For instance, let's say this person was bound and determined to live in a city of millions and millions of people. Emory then becomes a little more attractive, right? Oh, sure. Emory travels, as it were. It does, and you're already in Atlanta anyway. For sure. So you have some options there. And obviously Knoxville, not quite as big. So <laughs> not quite. those are the kind of balancing acts. We could go on, honestly, yeah. all night and just name things that are like, well, that could actually play into this. And this is why these decisions are never black and white. I'm like, yeah, I see Tennessee is probably coming out ahead, but... It's not 100% Tennessee, 0% Emory. There are choices here in each instance that can affect what's going on. Yeah. On paper, Tennessee wins. Fine. Yeah. All right. You ready for one last one? Yes. Scenario five. Uh, and this one hits kind of close to home, maybe for both of us. Uh, certainly some of the California schools that I'm about to mention are in play here. So applicant says... I'm trying to choose between, and there's four coming, so between UC Berkeley, UCLA, the University of Chicago, and the University of Michigan. Starts with four, but very quickly whittles it down. I've ruled out Michigan and UCLA for so several factors that are not relevant to this discussion. That's the end of that. So we're down then to UC Berkeley versus the University of Chicago. I have no scholarship, this person says, at either Berkeley or Chicago. Full sticker for both. Uh, for full sticker price, which is going to maximize my odds of landing a job in big law right out of law school? Does it matter that one is ranked fourth and the other twelfth? How much does it matter? And it goes on to ask some more questions, but I think we've pretty much gotten to the root of it. If one can do better at Berkeley, like Law Review, for example, but not as well as Chicago, still get good grades with some A's and B's, uh, would there be a more clear answer to which option is the better option? And is it worth paying sticker at both than it is to attend a school ranked in the mid-20s? So uh, out of left field, a question at the end. Let's uh -huh. table that, that last bit and just talk Chicago versus Berkeley full sticker. Yeah, it's an interesting scenario that they set up. Two mm -hmm. West Coast schools versus two Midwest schools. Yeah, and then um, immediately so, uh, cut one of each. Yeah, they killed off Michigan and UCLA, which is an interesting battle uh, on its own right. Agreed. But, all right, I, w I wish I knew why. I know, <laughs> several <laughs> factors not killed. relevant. Like, come on. All right, so no money at Berkeley or Chicago. Mm -hmm. What is what is the choice here? Okay, 
let's go back because I think from the time that the the statistics were quoted here, they've changed a little bit because Possibly. I think the question said that Chicago was fourth and that Berkeley was twelfth. It was four versus twelve when this was posted. Yeah, and that's changed a little bit because Chicago is still four at U.S. News, but Berkeley's now nine oh, in U.S. Berkeley News. Go. And they've had a little bit of movement. I will cite the above the law statistics. Mm -hmm. And this year, Chicago moved into the number one position in terms of above the law's rankings yes, based on did. outcomes. Berkeley's 11th. So when you get into a school that is that powerful, as we'll see, it becomes a really attractive thing. And when you're paying full ride, um, obviously, that can you got to think about it. So let's, let's first off find out what the cost is. Berkeley for a California resident, and I'm just going to assume that it's a California resident cost. If not, that changes this. 282000 as an overall cost. Okay. Chicago, three sixty. dollars So we're looking at about an $80,000 difference in the school choices here. Well, let's take a look at what you get for that 80000 if you went to Chicago or what you get for saving 80000 by going to Berkeley. As far as the employment score, Chicago, 92%. Obviously, extremely high. Berkeley's still great, 88.2. And think about some of the other scores that we've actually seen right. uh, floating around out here, like Emory, 22nd ranked school, 71.5. Mm -hmm. Here, we've moved up to the ninth rank school, 88%, the fourth rank school, 92%. These are definitive advantages for these particular schools. Underemployment at Chicago is very low, 1.4. Yeah. This is like pan again. You're, you're pretty much getting a job that's going to look pretty good. Uh, Berkeley's a little higher, 3.6%. Yeah, it's not bad. They both do great at big firms, 66% for Chicago, 57% for Berkeley. The clerkship rate's ridiculous at Chicago. I mean, it's absolutely insane. It's 21%. That's wild. Yeah. It, it's, it's huge. It's part of the reason their big law score is so low. Right. It's because their clerkship rate is so high. <laughs> it's like, sorry, we got the even better job in, in many instances. Um, Berkeley's is no slouch. It's 9.8. But Honestly, 80000 bucks more to go to Chicago, I'm probably going to make that choice here. So that's a type of debt where you'd actually be okay with it. 21% into federal clerkship rates. Two-thirds of the class gets a big law job. Pretty much, it, unless you are at the very bottom or have had problems, mm -hmm. going to Chicago is going to serve you extremely well. Now, if the scenario at Berkeley was a bigger difference, like it was cheaper, they gave you money somehow, right. um, then that was, I would start to open the door to that. But $80,000 isn't so much that I feel like I want to give that give up those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Now, this goes back to something that you've pointed out several times. For me to make that choice to go to Chicago, I have to have that ultra competitive, I want the big law job. Right. I want the federal clerkship or some type of clerkship. If I'm that person who's like, I don't know, well, then it's probably not worth it. Yeah, maybe save the money at that point. Don't take that gamble. Yeah, and you're also going to be in the shark tank. Yeah. You're, you're dealing with uh, a number of people who are going to be exceedingly sharp. And I'm not saying that they're mean. I'm just saying they're going to be very aggressive about pursuing the best possible right. outcome for themselves. Nor are you saying that Berkeley is non-competitive. No, and it's highly competitive. <laughs> I will say this. I used to teach classes up at Berkeley, LSAT classes mm -hmm. in the law school, um, not for the law school. But I love the Berkeley students. Um, some of the funnest times I ever had were just hanging out with the classes I had up there. We'd always go out after class and drink at uh, the bars down on Telegraph. Nice. Um, I'm a huge fan of Berkeley as a school in general. I really like the students. I think they're extremely intelligent and also kind of really cool. Like yeah. they're very, they have a laid back element to them. So uh, this was a while ago, but I really enjoyed my time teaching classes there. I've never taught at Chicago, so I can't make the direct comparison, but it's not like I'm anti-Berkeley. I'm, I'm a fan right. of Berkeley in general. No, you're, you're just pro opportunity. And I think in this case, paying $80,000 for the opportunity Chicago is going to give to a certain type of person, this applicant, it's well worth the money yeah. or the risk, if you could call it that. You see this with a lot of the, the, the top six and especially the top three. And then, you know, really Chicago. Chicago's right there. 
you should it really should be a top four to me. Um, NYU has some interesting numbers, but Columbia has really solid numbers too. But these schools all produce like incredible outcomes. Now, if you have to pay $300,000 more for it, then there's real questions. Right. But a lot of times when you talk to lawyers in, in the field, they'll say, if you get a chance to go to one of those schools, go. Take it. Yeah. They want to see, because it's, it's as close to the golden ticket as you're going to get in the law school field. And if your goals in life are to really try to excel and get to the top of whatever field you're looking at, those schools are best positioned to make that happen. Now, if you're like, I don't know, and I just want to have a, you know, a, a fun life, and I want to have four kids, and, you know, be able to only work 40 hours a week, that's probably not the right direction. And that's where so much of what you have pointed out comes into play. It's like, you got to know yourself, right? You got to have a good understanding of what it is you want out of life before you start making choices that could saddle you with several thousand dollars a month in debt. Yeah. And that's probably the biggest lesson out of all of this is that there are really no true right answers. It just depends upon the person. It depends, honestly, on their type. For sure. And their, what I would think is their expectation of success. Exactly. If, if you know Berkeley well, if you like it there, if you're happy in that environment, or there's something about Chicago that maybe turns you off. The winners, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, no judgment here. I don't blame you. Then you're actually putting yourself into a really risky position because if you do go to one of these schools, you pay the sticker and you can't perform. You can't actually cut it. Or you can't compete. You've paid an awful lot of money on a losing bet, frankly. You have, and you've got to be careful too. Right. Uh, one of my Berkeley students actually from years ago, one of the coolest guys actually <laughs> um, that I ever taught, just a fun, fun dude. He got into Chicago and he went there and I'd not talked to him about the decision. He, this was something that he had done after the class and he and I maintained some contact, and, but he was just making his applications. He was going to get in almost everywhere. He went to Berkeley and uh, he called me the first week and he goes, I've made a terrible mistake. I was like, <laughs> what do you mean? I mean, Chicago's a great school. He goes, yeah, but I never thought to ask where the school was. Right. I thought it was going to be in downtown Chicago because That's I not. like city life. <laughs> and I was like, oh, dude, you should have asked me. It's in Hyde Park. Yeah. He goes, it's sleepy. <laughs> he was upset about it. Um, and he ended up doing great there and, and graduating. He got but over it. That's good. He news. got over it because, you know, he was able to make friends and stuff. He was that kind of guy. <laughs> but it was just funny because he was like, I didn't do my homework. He didn't visit it. He didn't really ask anybody about it. And it's like your Toronto student. Oh, I've never driven a car. Exactly. Okay, yeah. Then LA is probably not your spot in three weeks. And it's that's one of the unspoken pieces. We've touched on it, but I, I really want to drive it home is do your research beyond what you can just dig up on the internet. Go to these schools, talk to the students, find, you know, discussion forums and actually engage and interact with people who go there, who have been there. Um, do your research beyond just the computer screen, because these numbers will tell you a lot but they don't define your potential experience. And that's the most important thing in a lot of regards. Yeah, you need to enjoy law school to do well in it. You need to be comfortable to be able to show your, your greatest potential. Yeah. So, well, at least it's think, hard to succeed if you hate it there. Yeah, if you're uncomfortable, it's not like, it's not going to be easier. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, it's well put. Um, do you want to touch very, very quickly as we kind of wrap this up? Because I... I feel like if I throw more scenarios at you, you're just going to... I'm done with in. scenarios. Yeah, no, you should be done. You should. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully what, what, what we've done is covered the tools. Right. You can see how we did it. And it, like I said before, the description of the analysis I'm making is extremely surface. I don't just look at the under or the regular employment scores and say, there we go. I go inside of it. I sure. look at the geography of all these things. And we didn't really have the opportunity to go super deep. We can do that on another day. Um, but... Or better Take yet, those. leave it to the listener to yeah, do they that. Can this do is that. about empowerment, frankly. It is. Take a look at the information that's out there, start sifting it, and start thinking about what it means. That'll, that'll be the fastest way to learn about all this. For sure. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, you were... No, I was going to say, well, there's, there's one final component. I think at some point down the road we'll dive deeper into this because it's fascinating to me and it's... Um, it's a part of this that I think is often overlooked or at least under uh, emphasized, but that's the idea. We've talked a lot about scholarships. Um, 
the idea that these things aren't necessarily static, either scholarships or even acceptances. There's ways that you can really play schools off of one another in a negotiation style. Um, I, I don't know if you want to touch on this really briefly, but I think it's, it's a necessary component for people to at least be aware of. Yeah, it, and I'll tell you what, we'll do a whole podcast on it. It's um, one of my favorite things, especially these days where it's uh, a little needier on the school side of things. You're in much more control than maybe in 2010. Oh, it's totally changed. Yeah. It used to be that you didn't hear a whole lot about it. And now you hear about it constantly. Yeah. And we've actually touched on it already in the podcast series by talking about how you can use later LSATs to get a better score, which then makes you more attractive, which allows you to negotiate uh, for better financials. Mm -hmm. In all these decisions, I just assumed it was static. You know, I'm like, okay, you got this scholarship, we're done. Right. If the choice that you're faced with is one where you come out and you're like, I don't like the choice, I don't like the outcomes, well, then go change the inputs if you <laughs> want a change of the outcomes. And so the easiest one to change, quite honestly, is your LSAT score. For sure. You can't change your GPA very easily because you've already spent four years putting that in place, but you can change your LSAT score. And so that's one way to kind of get in there. And that allows you by itself to you know, increase your negotiating power. Um, the other thing I would point out is, is that a lot of times I see students come in and they try to make negotiation moves from the wrong position or the wrong angle. Schools aren't going to negotiate with anything other than schools they perceive as direct competitors right. or as superior schools. So, you know, it will go back to that capital university example because <laughs> it's the most stark. If you go to Miami and you say, Hey, I've got a full ride at capital. Their response is going to be, we don't care. Probably it's going to be who? Well, they know who what? capital is. Well. These law schools know each other. <laughs> There's professional courtesy. Um, but, but they're going to respond with that. We don't care about that. And that's great. And congratulations. But we're not competing with capital. We're, they're not taking students from us in, in, a, in a true sense. So if you want to go there, that's fine. But we're not going to move our offer. Yeah. And even when you get into, like, say, the top 10, top 15, top 30, you have to be careful. Because I remember once a student that I had was trying to get into the University of Pennsylvania, a top 10 school. And they were using, I think, George Washington, which is like a low 20s, 30 type of school. And they had already written Penn and said, well, I got a full ride offer at GW. Will you increase your offer? And Penn had offered them some money. They just hadn't offered them anything close to a full ride. Right. And Penn came back and was like, mm -mm, no, we're not moving because GW isn't who we see that we're competing with. Georgetown yep. would be closer. <laughs> all right. But they see themselves as competing with other schools in the top 10, the, the, you know, the Berkeleys and the Dukes and these kinds of schools. Right. And so you can't use schools that are outside the range. You need a good offer from a school that's either equal, roughly, or better to push another school. Yeah. And, and of course, you can also be really clear about it. You'd be like, look, I want to go here. You're my school. You're my number one. If we can get to this number this will do it for me. I'll commit. It's become a game of incredible precision at times. Mm -hmm. You can really dangle it out there. The thing that you, I always say is you have to be ethical about it. You know, if, if you don't have any interest in a school, it's not cool to play that game. If you tell somebody, if you can go ahead and give me X dollars a year, I'm going there. And they give you X. And then you're like, no, but you run to the next door school and you're like, look what Psych. I just got. <laughs> That's not cool, man. Yeah. So, But you do need, like any good negotiation, you need leverage. And in this case, the leverage comes, I think, in the perception of some sort of like adversarial caliber. Like they have to be roughly equivalent or, again, underdogs for them to, to want to fight for you. Yeah, and that could be possibly geographical, but it's usually not. It's usually rankings-oriented. Yeah. Isn't there a story from Arizona that uh, yeah. you were telling me at one point about geography playing into this that was yeah. bonkers? Yeah. There was um, a student last year I was talking to, and she was trying to work between Arizona State and Arizona. And Arizona State just wouldn't move. Um, she was she lived in Phoenix, so um, Arizona State was like, 
they thought, okay, we've got a local Phoenix resident. We're not competing with Arizona in their minds. And so even though she'd gotten a better offer at Arizona and tried to use that at Arizona State, they just kind of were like, mm -mm. Yeah, the convenience factor was what dissuaded them from offering her more money. It's too convenient for her. She'll go here. We don't need to it, entice her. It's exactly right. And it's if crazy. I recall, she had offers from Alabama and Emory with money as well. And I'd have to check this, but Arizona State was a lot more interested in those two oh. because they, even though they're all the way across the country, they uh, they were they were more in their sphere as opposed to Arizona, <laughs> which was um, ranked a little bit lower. But financially, for her, Arizona was by far the better choice, and she was going to stay in that area. And so she made that choice to go to Arizona, and never really didn't look back. It was kind of like I'm good. Yeah. It's, the whole thing is just a, a fascinating swirl of mystery sometimes. But um, do your research, and you can actually figure some of this stuff out. You mentioned before, Dave, that there are ways that you can actually improve the metrics, the inputs, which is a nice word that you used. Uh, and you referred to the LSAT, which is certainly one of the more obvious ones. But it's not the only one. I think people can make themselves more attractive uh, on the nature of their application as a whole, the various softs or other component pieces. It definitely puts you in a better position up front. Yeah. And obviously, I think that's probably the biggest uncertainty. The worst thing that I see happen on a on a year to year basis is somebody who's got great numbers puts in a terrible personal statement or they allow someone to write a letter of recommendation without giving them proper guidance right. and they do them a disservice or they write an addendum about how they dropped their LSAT score by two points and they complain about it a lot when they should never have even written anything. Yeah. So one of the things that we always mention is we have admissions consulting packages that allow for assistance that will guide you from the very beginning all the way to the end. Or sometimes if you're like, I just need to talk to somebody about this negotiation scenario mm -hmm. or guess what, I just got arrested and now I've got to report this. How do I report <laughs> it? What do I do? Um, there's all sorts of different options from just essay work to complete application work to sure. literally just hourly kind of work. So if you are feeling lost, even after listening to all this, or you're not sure how to best position yourself or even how to best refine some of the pieces of right. your application, uh, there are definitely options out there. And certainly we offer a, a ton of them in case you need them. So you yeah. can just check out our website. We'll link it. For sure. But it is, yeah. it's admissions consulting that we talk about. And we do quite a bit of it, to be yeah, honest. From wholesale creation to last minute polish. Um, there's always a way typically to get better. Yeah, I've actually said before yeah. that I think it's one of the more valuable things that we do. I mean, think of the numbers we've been throwing around here in terms of price and cost, hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can have a tremendous impact on scholarships and various things just with tweaks and adjustments at times. Proper negotiation about, technique. Your LSAT score and your GPA are these black and white numbers, and they take a lot of work to get to, but they don't speak for you. Your application and what you write and at what your letters of recommend recommenders write, these are the things that actually speak for you, yeah. and you have a really large ability to influence all of that. That's within your control. So. Mm -hmm. When I look at it, it's the majority of your application, even if your LSAT and your GPA tend to actually convey a very strong message just by what they are. So if you are especially, you know, maybe a splitter or you're just under the medians, that's where you really want to make sure that the rest of your application flies. And if you're looking at the schools like Harvard and Yale, I can tell you for a fact that every time I see people get into those schools, mm -hmm. when I look at their applications, they are phenomenal yeah, they're like they did slam everything dunks right. mm -hmm. yeah there's no weakness that they were able to get by they're not apologizing for anything and you read it and you're like this is harvard level you can tell when something has come in and it is really put together yeah the beauty of having seen enough of those is that we can help people get there oh yeah definitely all right well john any final comments no i mean this is obviously covered <laughs> A ton of ground. I guess my only last comment would be one of gratitude. You bore the brunt uh, of a lot of my questioning tonight, so thank you. Well, I'm going to go drink the rest of this Ho Garden six pack. <laughs> Honestly, that's my. I'm going to go pour out the rest of the this another high life. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We really appreciate it. If you get a chance, subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube. We'd love it if you'd rate us as well. And if you have any questions or topics that you'd like us to cover, and we've gotten a bunch of requests so far that we will be addressing in future episodes, please send us an email either at lsatpodcast at powerscore.com or lsat at powerscore.com. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you.